You're listening to Trek FM. This is Steve Sansweet of Rancho Obi Wan, and you're listening to the 602 Club. There was a little bar in Mill Valley where all the Starfleet trainees used to go. The 602 Club. You know it. <laughs> I was there more times than I can remember. <laughs> Serious? What are you doing here? Answering your letter. You said you were worried about Ambridge. What's she doing? Training you to kill half breed. Serious, she's not letting us use magic at all. Well, I'm not surprised. The latest intelligence is that Fudge doesn't want you trained in combat. Combat? What does he think? We're forming some sort of wizard army. Well, that's exactly what he thinks. That Dumbledore is assembling his own forces to take on the Ministry. Is becoming more paranoid for the minute. The others wouldn't want me telling you this, Harry, but things aren't going at all well with the Order. Fudge is blocking the truth at every turn, and these disappearances are just how it started before. Voldemort is on the move. Well, what can we do? Someone's coming. I'm sorry, I can't be of more help. But for now, at least... It looks like you're on your own. He really is out there, isn't he? We've got to be able to defend ourselves. And if Ahmed refuses to teach us how, we need someone who will. Welcome, everyone, to the Hog's Head Bar. I'm so excited you're here. That's right, we shifted over from the Leaky Cauldron. It was a, it's just a little too highbrow for us tonight. Uh, we just didn't want to be seen. We've got a seedy group with he, me here to talk about Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix, and we're trying to hide out from he who must not be named. So uh, I'm so excited to have these these ladies here in the Hog's Head. Megan, it's, it's, it's great to have you back. I'm excited to be back. I'm so happy to talk more Harry Potter. Me too. Me too. And <laughs> oh, Drea, it's good to have you back as well. Thanks. Me too. I'm really sad about this particular installment of Harry Potter, but I love to talk about anything Harry Potter. So mm, yeah, me too. I in, in fact, I was I was online just last night as as we were watching this again, and I'm making all my notes, of course, but I'm also searching the site the universal website you know for harry potter because they've got the official store there for what they sell at the harry potter world and i'm like oh i need a i need a ravenclaw tie because i'm in ravenclaw right so i'm like trying to find out how much that costs and how much a scarf from them would cost and I so i meant to wear my robes and tie today i totally forgot oh that would have been awesome we would have just are you're a ravenclaw right megan no i'm a hufflepuff Okay. What are you, Drea? I'm a Ravenclaw. Yes, Ravenclaw. Yeah. We're the wise I have my ones. my moments where the sorting hat once put me in Slytherin, and then I convinced it to change its mind. Oh, good for you. <laughs> good for you. Well, don't change your mind. Don't change the channel. We're here on Trek FM, and you can find us all over the place, Trek FM shows. You can find us on iTunes at iTunes.com slash Trek FM, and of course, we're on Twitter at Trek FM, Facebook at Facebook.com slash Trek FM, and of course, the Babel Conference, which is our listeners-only discussion group, is the best place to have a conversation with any of us about the shows that we're on. And you can check that out at uh, Facebook.com. Just type in Babel in the search field there. It'll bring you to that group, and we'll let you right in. And, of course, uh, you know we're all over the place there on the interwebs. But if you would rather just send us an email, go to trek.fm slash contact, choose a show, choose the 602 Club. And, hey, if you're not into writing things out, just leave us a voicemail. Go to speakpipe.com slash trekfm and you can send us a voicemail straight from your computer. And I love getting those. So uh, who knows? We may get another one from Alice soon. I don't, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, that's all the places you can find us. As I said, we're here to talk about Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix. And this one, it's it's different than the others uh you know we say that about you know we said that about the last two but there's something about this one and especially the book was 
But I really felt like this was kind of the aftermath, like, of everything. It's, it's almost as if the culmination of everything that's happened to Harry finally hits him in this movie. And I found that a really interesting idea for Rowling to, to choose to do with her character as he, it's like all the emotions he's ever had finally just break forth. And so I just kind of want to ask you guys about that and what you thought about, especially with how they bring that and translate that to the screen. Mm. Yeah. um, I think one of the things that they did to good effect is they kind of scaled back Harry's outburst just a tad um, from the book, which I think works better on screen. Uh, I remember when this came out, the book came out. All, all of my friends that were reading it just constantly were complaining about how Harry's always yelling at everybody and he's just not fun anymore and why is he so upset about things and why can't he be happy anymore? And I was like, did we read the same last book because he literally watched someone die right in front of him and then like his parents came back from the dead out of his wand and he saw Voldemort, so... He almost died again. And nobody believes that any yeah. of this happened to him and calling him a liar. It's like he's totally justified in being totally emotional right now because he's going through a lot. Um, but they, I feel like they did scale it back a little bit from the book, but it's still totally there. And Dan Radcliffe really has some really great stuff to work with here. Um, and I think you can really see him coming into his own even more as an actor and developing a lot of the subtlety um, in being a really great actor. And um, I love that he gets to work with Gary Oldman again so much more closely in this. And then he also gets much more time with Alan Rickman in this one too. So in some ways it feels like yeah, we're coming down from that fourth movie, but we're also getting back to some of those relationships we haven't had a chance to explore for a little while. I I agree with all of that. Um, I feel like he portrayed the angsty character really well, but he just did it as sort of a quiet angsty instead of a loud angsty. Um, he had his outburst, but I think if it was an entire visual movie of that, it would have been really hard to deal with as a viewer. Um, so I like them incorporating sort of that angry, angsty, outcast feeling um, into other ways. Um, and I also think I love the, so the book had a lot more Luna in it than the movie did. Um, and I, I sort of miss that. Um, but I do like how she delivers some really key components to the story in this, um, like pointing out like, well, if I was, you know, if I was him, I'd want you to feel really alone too and things like that. Um, so I, I really, in, I enjoyed this one. Um, we were talking a little bit uh, before before we got started here um, about how this was sort of like um, the tough part of therapy. Like this is the part you go through where like it really sucks and you think like the end of the world is happening and you just hate everyone, but in the long run, you're hoping it'll pay off, but you don't see it yet. Um, so for anybody who's been in therapy, hopefully that resonates a little bit with you. Yeah, I, I mean, I really, I really enjoyed it. And I, I, I like, I, and it is different because it gets a little more, I guess, political maybe than some oh, of the yeah. others. I, I think you hit it on the head, Drea. You know, that idea that uh, in a lot of ways, Harry kind of has an emotional breakdown in the story, you yeah, know, and it's, it's to be oh, expected. Yeah. I mean, uh, if you think about his upbringing and you think about everything that he's been through, uh, and then, of course, it all came to a head in the last movie, in the last book. And like you said, he comes into this year. He feels like he's been abandoned by his friends because they haven't been writing him. He feels abandoned by Dumbledore, his closest ally in this, and the only one who truly believes him, he feels like, in a lot of ways, who's not even trusting him. Uh, he's not even looking at him. Uh, you know, and uh, he feels like he is, you know, a wizard on an island all by himself. And I feel like he really has hit rock bottom when this starts. Yes, that's an excellent way to put it. And I mean, I think that when, for me, I, I was always frustrated, I guess, with the people who didn't understand this book or didn't like it, because to me it seems totally. so clear that yeah, if this I kid totally doesn't agree. have the breakdown here, there's no way he will be able to do what he needs to do in the next two books, in the next few films. Yeah. 
Well, you also, I think sometimes we lose sight of the fact that like, he's still kind of a kid. Like yeah, he's, he's 15. being forced to act as an adult and he is yeah. still, he's 15 years old. Now, what 15 year old should have the emotional intelligence to deal with this? There are adults in this world that don't have the emotional intelligence to deal with an ounce of what he has to go through. So for him to have a total and utter emotional breakdown, I'm like, kid, you do what you got to do. You be you. Well, and what I love about it too is, I think in the scene where they have all gone to Hogsmeade to have that first meeting before Dumbledore's army has really started, um, like he's hit bottom there and Hermione and Ron, and Ron do a great job of building him up and bringing him back and starting to help him to realize that there are people that believe in him and trust him and that he has value and brings a lot to the table. Um, and through that encouragement, he really starts to take agency and take control of his own fate. And the whole Dumbledore's army thing is just, it's one of my favorite things that happens in any of the books because he really starts to become who Harry Potter the adult is going to become, I think. Well, and he so really starts to like, so throughout most of it, you're just like, he's a kid who ended up having this thing happen to him and he's now got this stigma and he's famous and all this. And I think this was his first opportunity where he didn't really like luck into it or he wasn't forced to do with it. They made a conscious decision to found this army and to be stronger than anybody expects them to. It's almost like he's earning his, his chops, you know, like he earned that title and he earned that like fame and glory he's got but it's, but not for more of it, like for his own, it's almost like he now believes it himself. Like he can do it. He can do the thing. <laughs> I think that's a, that's a great way to put it. And the idea that of all of the films and all of the books, I think this is probably the most personal for Harry. It's the one where it's, it's truly his emotional journey. There's a lot of things that happen in the book that don't happen in the movie. And there's a lot of things that happen in the movie, but really this is about him and him finding himself in a way that he hasn't before. And I, I think one of the, the key things about Harry that's so wonderful and so beautiful is that, you know, he could have turned out to be Anakin Skywalker, basically. You know, he <laughs> could have been the next Dark Lord because of everything he's been through. But for Harry, everything he's been through makes him never want to be like that. You know, yeah. uh, it's had that effect on him. And this is the book where it's not that he's learning to think, oh, how great am I? It's just to realize I do have worth that I... Is beyond what's been kind of given to me. Right. Like, and yeah. and he has the ability to pass that on to others and to be able to teach others and to be in, able to encourage others and um, lift others up through his own actions and what I love about him is that there's no nothing about self in it it's not about because he says to everybody I love that at Hogshead he's like I I nearly always had help you know some of it was an accident you know yeah. but they remind mm -hmm. him that but you also did it you know and yeah. the, it it's that kind of wonderful idea that community is really what matters you know, it to me, it's that feeling that like this, uh, you can have a value of self-worth and self-confidence without it being ego and without it being like you have this pompous attitude. Like you need to understand your self-worth in order to teach others to have their self-worth. Like you become great. You make others become great by honoring how great you can be yourself without that attached ego with it. Like you get from the Malfoys. Oh, yeah. Well, and, and, and the wonderful idea of like, you're stronger together. Like, yes. you know, and I think that's what they all learn this, this Dumbledore's Arlie and you specifically think of uh, Luna and Neville, Neville and, and mm -hmm. Ginny and, you know, Harry and Ron and Hermione, they kind of make up that core of Dumbledore's army and they, they will be the kind of the leaders in school. Uh, as everything continues to go awry. But it's because they learn to be that cohesive group together. And I think that's really just something special. And it, it, what's wonderful is that it's that sense of togetherness that helps bring Harry out of that malaise. Mm -hmm. But it's also yeah. the thing that saves him in the end, which we'll talk about later, which I think is really awesome, you know? So yeah. 
you know, if you're ever wondering if Rowling is a good writer, yes. Um, and <laughs> uh, Rowling just does an incredible job of tying all of these things together. And I think allowing Harry to have his emotional collapse is probably one of the smartest moves that she made. But I think it also is important to show all of us, you know, adults and kids, there are times when it's okay to not be okay, you know? Yeah. It helps that she was experiencing that herself and that she could really write from like a genuine place of someone who's sort of been through this experience and, you know, hey guys, it's okay if I'm not okay sometimes, but it takes, you know, a family and an army to help to bring us all back. And when we can do it, we can do it together. So it's really great that she writes it from, it's so, it's, I feel like it's so strong because it's so genuine. Yeah, it makes Harry a, a real human character as opposed to some omniscient, all perfect being. He is an emotional person. He's a human. He makes mistakes. He has emotional breakdowns and he needs his family and friends to help him feel better, just like anyone else who goes through a hard time. I yeah. mean, it takes a wizarding village. It sure so, does. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, gosh. Um, <laughs> well, I think one of the things that you said earlier, Megan, is that this movie has a sense that is different. And I think this is one of the reasons that um, David Yates comes in as director because um, he had done a lot of political thrillers. Uh, he'd done some really good ones, mm -hmm. actually. And this idea of the propaganda, the narratives, and the fear, they're all just permeating throughout this film. You know, after Voldemort has come back, the entire wizarding world has been saying, oh, well, he's not really back. But the reason they're saying that is because the newspapers are telling that, the media is driving this kind of false narrative that the Fudge administration has been putting out because they don't want to deal with the fact that Voldemort's returned. And kind of love that Fudge's name actually you find out why he's named Fudge. Well, he's fudging the truth about the return of Voldemort because he doesn't want to deal with it. And I love the way those two things play together. And it's a, it's kind of a damning look at media and politics. Rowling is, is not pulling any punches in this book at all. Oh, no, not at all. Especially when it comes to a character like Umbridge, right? Like there's, she's such a, character that you hate so much but there's a lot to unpack with her character because first I mean she's got that facade that she insists on wearing um and then her insistence on not teaching ch these children the truth um and her clear outrageous desire for power um I mean there's so much going on in terms of political motivation and political underhandedness going on with Umbridge. It's it's phenomenal. I think we can all agree she's a real witch with a capital B. Oh, yeah. <laughs> she's one of those <laughs> villains that you really, really hate. Like, she did so good, you hate her. She stands out to me above and beyond Voldemort as a, as a villain. And that's talking through the whole series. I mean, yeah, Voldemort is truly evil we've got seven books to tell us this and eight movies but man like her brief her one appearance in this book she's so she's just so she's just so <laughs> like I, I can't even tantrum right he does he looks like a little kid throwing a tantrum and then this evil mother like looming over him it's it's terrible and she's masochistic and uh she's just she horrific. is She's a sadist. She's straight up a sadist, yes. That is the word I was trying to remember. That's exactly the same thing my husband said when we were watching it earlier, is she's such a sadist. And, oh, God, I mean, she's just... And she does get perverse pleasure out of yes. causing pain oh to God. children. It's just disturbing. Watching her with McGonagall is like... Oh, yeah. I, oh, my God, I Yeah, love don't Minerva piss off, you know, McGonagall. So we know what happens when you piss off McGonagall. Yeah. So. What what I love is what you're saying, though, because my wife said the exact same thing about her compared to Voldemort. She said because she feels real in the yes. sense that, like, we face that kind She's of real evil person. all over the world, you know, yeah. with different leaders and political power. 
And that's what I love about the way this movie works is I love, you know, obviously it's the longest book and there are a lot of things that they kind of, they don't gloss over, but they allow to pass through with the newspapers flying at you and you see the headlines. But the way in which they're really poking at the media being complicit with the government for propagating a lie Mm -hmm. because it's expedient for the government and themselves, it's like, oh gosh, she's really writing about our world. What an interesting movie to be watching in 2016, given the state of things in the United States with the media and this crazy presidential election. Like, we won't go into it, but the commentary in this movie, when you look at it through literally today's lens, is it's incredible. Next year, it won't have the same feeling when you watch this movie. Well, at maybe. All. I, I don't, I think what's interesting is that it doesn't seem to matter anymore, whatever side you're on. It's just awful. Like it's yeah. just, it's just a, it, it makes your mind boggle about yeah. how bad it is. And then like you said, Megan, they are using this, the ministry is using this crisis. You never let a good crisis go to waste, they say, uh, <laughs> in politics. So they use this to take over Hogwarts and they're going to teach the kids what to think. Yeah, Not umbrage make Hogwarts great again. Like. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> We're gonna make it's gonna be huge. It's gonna be big. It's gonna be the best. Uh, you know, um, but it it not. Yeah. And, and we're not going to teach them how to think. We're not going to teach them how to be critical. We're not going to teach them yeah. anything that doesn't make them a little conformists. Well, and then interesting thing is, I feel like, again, going back to, if, or if you're curious if Rowling is a great writer, is she's sort of been weaving this subtle idea of the media and its play and things since you she introduced Rita Skeeter and yes. since you have these sort of web it's, it's sort of slowly coming and then all of a sudden there's this opportunity and like you said they seize the crisis and they like just completely blast it out of the water and just manipulate it and abuse it to all extent um and it's just like it's so subtle and then all of a sudden it sort of explodes and you're like and it is it's because it's so much like real life that it's kind of terrifying and you're like oh god this is real this could really happen tomorrow this s is <laughs> real november 1st yeah <laughs> well and and what it, what's so crazy about it, i mean not only are we trying to create little conformists who aren't going to challenge the power of the ministry of magic But we're doing it under the guise of we're going to make it safe. We're going to give you a safe environment. Let's not ruffle anybody's feathers. We don't want any trigger warnings or anything. We're just going to like, I mean, why would you need to use spells in my classroom? You know, like this whole idea of creating a safe space for kids to learn, but they're not actually going to learn anything because they're not being challenged. They're not being moved to grow. They're not told how to think critically. It's all out the window. No, they're just being told. This is what you think. And don't ask why, but this is this is what you think. And I mean, gosh, I don't if I look at what's going around in the world in so many of our educational places, it's it's ridiculous. And it is scary that it looks like this. And so it's like, wow, rolling is is just nailing it and in a way that it reminds me of how sometimes when I watch uh, Star Trek Deep Space Nine these days, it seems even more relevant than mm-hmm. it was when it first came out. I feel like this book specifically in the Harry Potter universe is even more relevant than it was when it first came out. And it, it's even scarier how much more of this feels like, oh, I just look up my, my window or watch you know, CNN or, or Fox News or whatever, and that's exactly what it looks like. Yeah. I think my only big beef with the translation from the book to the movie was that we lost a lot of Dumbledore in the movie. And yeah. I, I really wish we'd had just a little bit more. And I, we lost a lot of a lot of things. Um, but the I, I think really I missed out on a lot of the descent between, like the, the breakdown of that relationship between Dumbledore and Harry. You get it very obviously when it does happen, but you don't, they didn't really be into you how completely absent he was it's not lurking in the back well I mean because in the book you're constantly hearing Harry's point of view and his thought process right and so he's constantly wondering about it right and because we're not in Harry's head in the same way we're not treated to that in the same way in the movie yeah 
I know exactly what you mean. Right. And and back on the political side, we didn't get a lot of I mean, you kind of saw it when she tried when Umbridge tried to uh, kick out Trelawney. And yeah, he, like didn't say anything about anything happening until that moment. And he picked his, you know, he picked his battle very specifically and very politically and very strategically. Um, and the book was riddled with situations like that. So, I mean, that's the other sort of real strong Dumbledore part we got in the movie or in the book, which is, I can understand why they would leave that out of the movie because that over and over again, sort of, it, right. It, it's the same. It has the same effect. Um, but those, I mean, those were things I did kind of miss is him in the in the movie a little bit i will say though re-watching this movie this time it really jumped out at me what a phenomenal job michael gambin does as this dumbledore right i mean for the longest time i had a really hard time accepting him as the new dumbledore because i loved the original casting job but he really he he's he's dumbledore to me and he He's got that, he's got the fierceness that Dumbledore needed um, by the time we got to this part of the books. And just, I'm just so glad that, I mean, I'm not glad that we got to bring him in, but. <laughs> You're glad that, that he was who I'm, brought. I'm glad that he's the replacement, right? And I think, I think he ended up being a better casting job for this portion of the story. I was talking to my wife about this last night and. Because uh, we're a little bit of a different mindset on this. I feel like I like Gambin, but sometimes he plays the role with a little bit too much intensity, especially like in that fourth movie where he's like, did you put your name on the Goblet of Fire? And, yeah. and like yeah. the the thing about that is, is that it's giving too much away about Dumbledore that she doesn't give away until the end of this book. I think, yeah, this is the movie where he came into the Dumbledore character, I feel yes. like. Yes, because the way that he reacts, especially, and we'll talk specifically about the very end with them talking about the prophecy, but that is so much more like the Dumbledore who, as written in the book. He's very calm, he's very mm -hmm. collected, but he's also very sorrowful, and you can see it in his eyes at that point. Like I feel like he nails it there, whereas there was too much intensity in that fourth movie, yeah. And but it, and it kind of gave away too much about the way that Dumbledore is struggling, which we don't know until that the very end of the fifth book and movie. And I think I still I still like him as Dumbledore. I just wish that he had dialed it back so mm -hmm. that this would have come as more of a shock that Dumbledore has been having this struggle. Because one of the great things about this this movie is that they do a great job of making him seem completely aloof to Harry, as if he doesn't yeah. care. And so that when you get to that last bit, it's like, well, if I hadn't seen his reaction in the fourth movie, I would have bought this even better, I think. And so it's it's mm -hmm. just a it's just a, a way that he played it in that fourth movie that I think kind of hurts what they're doing story wise here. But he's still fantastic. And I think this movie, like you said, he I think he just nails it. That's a really great assessment. I, I think I totally agree with you there. Um, you know, still miss Richard Harris, but um, yeah, I mean, you're you're totally right on that. I, I completely agree with you. I wish people could see because I'm just nodding furiously. <laughs> <laughs> we do that a lot. When we, we do. People can't see us, but uh -huh. we, yeah, we're like, we're like pointing at each other. Like, yeah, give me thumbs up and stuff. And, oh gosh. It's great. Um, maybe one day we'll do a video podcast where everybody can fun. like, yeah, it see would. what we're doing. So, um, well, I think this is a great way, you know, to go from Dumbledore, one of the older characters kind of jump into some of the new characters. And we talk about Dolores Umbridge a little bit. But I can't imagine better casting for than who they got. Imelda Staunton is, I just, she is that character. She, it's she like she stepped is. out of the book and onto the screen and it's, it's <laughs> unnerving. Yeah. It's so creepy in a good way. Like it should be, but <laughs> yeah. And how much does her cat room make you want to throw up? <laughs> I love cats and that's overkill for me. It's I'm a creepy. Huge cat fan and it's like I almost don't want cats again now. <laughs> it's creepy. It's part of that facade, right? Like watching it this time, I'm just like, 
she really like does she really like kittens and cats this much? She and can't. pink. Yeah, like does everything have to be pink? She really does. She really can't like those things as much as she puts on airs that she does. I I really feel like she's trying to cover up her, her black mask. black heart. Yes, exactly. She's done it. She has like completely embodied and mastered the art of personal branding. Yes, <laughs> her, is the her cat lady. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's crazy cats and pink because no one will suspect what a sadist she is if that's her personal brand well no like like now whenever you see someone in a full pink suit you immediately think that they're gonna make you right with a quill that that will scar your hand <laughs> and you run the other direction like she's totally embodied this yeah well and everything else that when you think of like a checker sign you now think of nike you see a woman in a pink suit and you now think of umbridge like yeah, it's. Uh, ooh, I'm getting the shivers just thinking yeah. about her. Talking about her just makes me uh, ill. <laughs> I mean, okay, so thinking of shivers, uh, Helena Bonham <laughs> Carter as Bellatrix Lestrange. I don't know of anybody who could play this character better, but yeah. I mean, the raw evil sexuality coming out of this woman, and I don't have either of you guys I still read the Cursed read it. Child. I'm holding okay. out. I can't I'm say anything out. then. So, but she is manically perfect she really is she's so she's frightening too like she's just so frightening she's frightening in it because you don't know what she's gonna do next way exactly yeah she's so unpredictable that uh, you just don't know what she's gonna do next she might laugh in your face or she might kill you it just depends <laughs> on the day she does a great job of that psychotic evil like just she yeah. reminds me of Harry Potter's Harley Quinn. Like, you just have yes. no idea what she's going to do next. Yes. But she's like the goth girl all the way through and through. It's just yes. like she just comes off as just, again, she makes my skin crawl too, but for a completely different reason. <laughs> totally different reason. It's like haunts my dreams. <laughs> and I, I, I don't remember the scene from, it's been so long since I had seen the movie, but the scene where she breaks out of Azkaban, it's only, you know, like maybe a minute long, maybe. I don't even think it's a full minute. That tiny little scene, though, the way that she's just laughing with glee and it really jumped out at me this time, just like how maniacal she is. Phenomenal. <sighs> So we got also, we don't get a ton of her, but I really like the actress who plays Tonks. I love Natalia Tenna. She's amazing. I want to see more. I want to see her work more. What other things that she's been in? Do you, can you think of anything off the top of your head? So the big thing that she's done since the Harry Potter films is Game of Thrones because she plays Asha um, on Game of Thrones. I don't watch Game awesome. of Thrones, so I have yeah. no idea. I'm I'm missing that one too. But I what I do love is that I feel like she fits that character so well and she really brings it the little bit that she has on screen, she brings it to life, I think, perfectly. So mm -hmm. I really do I really do like that. Um and I, I wish that there had been a little bit more of her. I uh, do especially too. since, you know, she in the book she plays more of a part in that sixth movie. So I think that's really interesting. And so um, but I, no, I, I like her a lot. And then I think we have to talk about Ivana Lynch as Luna Lovegood because, wow. She's so, she's so precious. See, she is like the yin to the Bellatrix yang. Like, she is also <laughs> a little bit crazy up there and you're not really sure. Like, I think they even say it. Like, you're not really sure if she's going to rub paint in her hair or she's going to scream at you. Um, but like she's so she's got the opposite thing. She's so nice and genuine and always gives everyone the benefit of the doubt, even though like people stealing her stuff and hiding it around the castle was not a kind prank. She was just like, oh, people are just messing with me. It's so sweet. You know, like it's just she she's such a breath of fresh air in this super dark movie. It's and and visually she is a breath of fresh air in such a dark movie. Yeah. Visually she's the exact opposite of Bellatrix Lestrange just like you've said. I mean, she's just so sweet and I love her fairy voice. I think they did a great she did a great job with that. The more I spend time with Luna Lovegood, the more I want to be best friends with her. You would make a great Luna Lovegood for Halloween. Oh, that would be fun. What I like about her is that, again, I feel like she walks out of the book 
and into the movie and the translation is perfect. Like there's yeah. nothing about her that doesn't feel like the book. And I think that that's really incredible that they were able to find somebody who so embodied the character. You just felt like she is Luna. And that's that's a wonderful thing. And so... And I love how Luna... Luna just is who she is, right? She never tries to be someone else and it makes her a social outcast, but she doesn't care because she's happy. Her life is happy, even though she's been through some really hard and terrible things. And I think that's one of the things that make her and Harry such good friends. I love to see people being understanding who they are and being who they are unapologetically and people befriending them because of that, because it's really hard to be who you are sometimes, especially when you're as odd as, as uh, Luna is. But she's just... A breath of fresh air, Drea. You totally nailed it. I, I agree. I, I was literally thinking like the whole being yourself thing and you said it and I was like, I literally had a big point at that yeah. one, like a big reaction. I think that's exactly what I love about her. And I think she gives that confidence that you really need to just be yourself. And it's hard at 15 to be, your, it's hard at 30 to be yourself. It's hard at 15 to expect them just to be themselves. And it's just, she's such an understated, amazing character. Yeah. What I love about her, too, is that she's another one of those kind of misfits that Harry picks up because yeah. Harry doesn't have a problem with the misfits. He doesn't see the Wizarding World the same way everybody else sees the Wizarding World. And Harry's kind of an outcast and a misfit, too, and that's why I think people mm -hmm. are kind of attracted to him, and he doesn't treat them as though they're weird. You know, Luna's not weird to him. Neville, in the end, is not weird to him. You know, all of these people, they're not odd or people he shouldn't make fun of or anything like that they're just people just like he is and he he tends to even if internally he might think that person's a little bit off they're you know a bit of a nutter he doesn't <laughs> say that out loud and he doesn't act like that out loud yeah and i think that's what makes him so special and i love the way that each one of these characters even i mean when they go to visit Gorp. Uh, and I love when they visit Grop, and it's not a great cgi character but the way <laughs> no. that harry reacts to that and saying yes to Hagrid, we will take care of him. Again, it's just so hairy to yeah. understand the idea that that's the only family he has left. So that means it's my family too. And see, I think a little addendum to that. I do think there are times where Harry does think Luna's weird. Like there are times where all of them think she's weird. But I feel like them thinking she's weird is not, and they don't approach it in a, from a place of judgment. They're right. not like, Luna, you're weird. They're just like, you're a little off, aren't you? And she's like, yeah. And they're like, okay, let's move on. Like they're <laughs> honest about things and they're, they're, you know, they're accepting of the fact that even though she's a little weird, it doesn't have to be normal. I mean, there really is no normal for Harry, but you know, he'll say like, you're a little bit weird or a little bit odd or like we're taking care of a giant in the forest guys. That's kind of weird. But like, it never <laughs> has this stigma <laughs> attached to it that like, it's bad or wrong. It just, it's just what it is. And they're going to go with it and they're going to, you know what? There's an exciting adventure in all of it. So why not? Yeah, you're right. It's without judgment. I think that's my favorite thing that you said, because it's so true. What's sad is that I wish that the uh, CGI was better in that scene. I do too. It yeah. was not good. Everything not. about it wasn't good. Gorp wasn't good and neither were the poor centaurs either. They're at yeah, least better than the yeah. first movie. But yeah, yeah, they're just it. The CGI kind of lacks you know, most of the Harry Potter movies, unfortunately. Yeah. Trying to get there, guys. Yeah. <laughs> um, trying. What's interesting, I think, though, is Dobie was really good. I thought the CGI work for him was was very well done. I think the same thing could be said for Creature in this mm -hmm. movie. I think the CGI work for him looks fantastic. And, and I love that he's the one thing that they tried to cut out of the film. And Rowling was like, no He's you, so you have important. to leave him in yeah and i i really don't and this is jumping ahead to movies we're not talking about yet i don't agree with the changes that they made to creature story but he's a, so important and i'm right there with rolling like you can't cut him out he has to be there 
Yeah, it's it's true. And she has, like we've said, there's lots of themes and lots of people that she's introduced over over several books, or you'll meet something in the first book that doesn't come back to play until the end. And it, that's, that's part of the beauty of what she's created. And to wait to introduce that until it's relevant sort of puts a damper on that. You know, if we didn't know anything about media until we had this sort of media blitz against Dumbledore and Harry, it wouldn't have the same effect as if we had known that sort of had these hints of it happening all along. So I agree that it was really important to keep him in there. Um, and he is a crotchety old creature. And that was, that's what makes him such a great character. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I agree. And the CGI was just so bad on some of them. So bad. We the only thing better, that... Guys. <laughs> that I wish is that they had had that box that he would like that he was going up to clean the picture with. Um, mm. I, I kind of wish that he had just been carrying around this box that he'd been keeping things in and that the locket was in there uh, because that's mm. part of the book where he's like hoarding all this stuff that they're trying to throw out. And one of the he's things get, yeah, is yeah. the locket, which will play huge in the next one. So anyway, it's, it's still, I'm, I'm glad they kept him in there and it's really good. What's interesting is that, you know, they bring in a new director and a new composer. And we talked about David Yates uh, with the political side. But I think also one of the things that's really interesting is the fact that I think he does a great job kind of finally melding all the visual styles. Yeah, I totally agree. I felt much more at peace with the visual style in this movie. Whereas uh, like, I think one of the reasons I'm not a big fan of the third movie is because all of the changes in the visual style were really jarring to me. Um, even though I know that's a lot of people's favorite in the movie series, but I felt more at home just in this version of the world watching this film again. I think you're right. Because what's interesting is I think that's kind of what's in our heads as the Harry Potter. Like when you say Harry Potter, I think most of us kind of think that three through seven, but I think what we're really kind of thinking of is five through seven, one and two. Like yeah. all of that is kind of what we think of. And I think it's really just because he takes everybody's ideas and the visual style finally becomes consistent because it's going to be the same director. You know, it's going to be the same kind of look. Uh, throughout the most of the films, the the lighting and everything is going to be very similar for the movies and everything. So I, I love the way that it ends up working out. And I think, just again, he was the perfect person to bring in to kind of drive this emotionally political development that we get into the Harry Potter universe, where it's all about the emotion of Harry and the politicized nature of what's happening between Harry Dumbledore and the ministry and all of that and I think he just does it so well so when I think it's important at this point too because I feel like at the end of the fourth and you have the return of of Voldemort and you have him kill Cedric you've sort of started this course that has to end like the next four movies the next three books are all like they're all about the same thing. They're less monster of the week, if you will, and more one consistent story that's split up into three books. And that's not to say that they don't all flow together, but you've definitely set yourself up for a very specific thing that has to be accomplished now, whereas you didn't have that until that point. And so I feel like the director they picked was so strong in being able to continue that theme throughout the rest of the series so that you felt that that flowed correctly instead of it being so disjointed as you go through it. I think on top of that, too, for me, I, I didn't really like the composer for the fourth movie. And what was interesting, though, is that they bring in a new composer who isn't really super well-known. It's Nicholas Hooper. And I think, to me, he's able to fit much more within what John Williams had created sound-wise. But I also thought he added a lot of great new themes to, to the Harry Potter universe that I really enjoy, that I enjoy listening to as much as a lot of the things that uh, I think John Williams created. So I think the music here was so much more successful. It obviously is a lot darker than a lot of the music, but it makes sense. So I, I think it was really great. 
the interesting thing with the music as well so i watched all of them again in series the other this week um for a different unrelated purpose um but you know it kind of worked double here um but what really struck me about this one is i watched the first four and i got to this one and all of a sudden we weren't starting the movie off with the iconic harry potter theme yeah, that's a great point. It's ve- and it's very unnerving when you when it starts to play and I'm like, where's that theme? And I look up and I'm like, oh no, it it's starting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's no theme. That's kind of telling me we're like down to business now. Like, <laughs> come on now. But yeah, it doesn't start with that theme, which was such an interesting stylistic choice that I don't think I really realized until I started all four of them and I expected it and then it didn't happen. And I was like, wait, what's going on here? What was really nice is the way that the music complements what's happening on screen because, like, the music that he creates for Umbridge, that kind of bouncy, like, bum, ba-dum, 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 mm-hmm. ba-dum. it's just, it makes your skin crawl as everything that's happening, and it's just so perfect. I really love that the way that he's able to capture the character in the music, and every time you hear it, you're just like, ugh. I'm going to have to listen to the soundtrack for this one because you guys are making me want to dive deep into this. <laughs> well, and and not just that, but I think like the way that he captures the Ministry of Magic, the first time that you enter the ministry yeah. with Harry and Mr. Weasley, and it's just, it's this kind of expansive thing, mm-hmm. but it also has this foreboding nature to it as it kind of gives you this feeling of like, this fascist it's feeling it's creepy in there and it's dark and it just uh it's it's really wonderfully done it's all underground megan you'd be like without windows for your whole it's, day it's underground and the walls are black marble like ugh. <laughs> That is not appealing in any way. Well, and the interesting thing is this is one of the movies where if you've played a lot of um, video games where you're in a a battle and there's really intense music and then you're fighting all the bad guys and then all of a sudden the music stops and you're like, oh, all right, I'm done with my fight. (laughs) Um, It sort of carries into this movie that way. Like they're they're running through there and they're trying to catch them entering the room of requirement and the music's fairly lighthearted. And then it gets kind of intense and then it gets a little light because they didn't do it. You know, like it, it follows that same sort of the music really helps guide how you should emotionally be invested in this one. It it really gives you an understanding of what you're trying to feel as well as what you're seeing. Yeah. But again, I didn't feel manipulated by the music. um, Cause you know, when the music is trying to force you into an emotion that the rest of the film isn't really providing, um, it's really jarring, but I didn't have that problem at all with this movie. I felt actually, you know, like I actually didn't pay too much attention to the music because it just, it felt so natural. I was never drawn out of the story by the music, which means it was doing its job. So what I liked too was the death of Sirius um, yeah. with oh, on the, the soundtrack, the death of Sirius also has the music with the battle and it has that, Uh, kind of driving nature to it as Mm -hmm. they finally get down to business as the order arrives and everybody's kung fu fight i mean wizard fighting uh (laughs) and i think that music is really excellent and then we get to that death of Sirius, and it's just this raw emotion as he's lost into the veil and it's just music so it's in harry you can tell he's screaming and then he runs after bellatrix and like that whole scene is just so well done and part of that is the music that's helping that happen and be successful so i'm i just i feel like nicholas super did a great job and i feel like they did a great job of creating a iconic scene that happens as quickly as it happens in the book. Like it's he's there and then he's gone. And then he's gone, yeah. And it's it's really it's heart wrenching, um, but it's it's beautifully done. And I love there's and it's consistent for movies. And I love this. And I know it's a te- a tactic or a technique that some don't. But I love that when Harry is screaming, it's pretty much silent. Like yeah, that is, I, that I like that choice here. Impact because you just have to imagine like the you just get that raw feeling and you're like hold on i need the tissues i'll be right back like you just it's just so powerful and and i loved that they honored that and they they knew the importance of doing that 
What I like is the scene that comes after that. Um, I love the fight between Voldemort and Dumbledore. Uh, I think it's a really interesting fight. I wanted to ask you guys about that specifically because, you know, in the book that chapter is called The Only One He Feared. Do you think that they captured that idea that Voldemort really does fear Dumbledore? That Voldemort really does fear Dumbledore and that's why um, the fight ends up the way it does? Or, I don't know, what are you guys' thoughts on that? Because I think this one is one where you can kind of go any way. I don't think in the movie that it comes across as him fearing Dumbledore. Um, but I think what really does come across is that Dumbledore seems to be pretty evenly matched against Voldemort. And I think this is, you know, I think in these movies, what tends to happen when there's wizards fighting is it just kind of turns into Dragon Ball Z Kamehameha episode where there's just (laughs) like colored lightning flashing back and forth across the screen and like they're supposed to be doing specific spells but it's it's just people being thrown back right whereas in this battle um you know like you're seeing these massively powerful spells that they're both doing like the fire that Voldemort shoots towards Dumbledore and then he does that amazing water globe around him I mean that would be terrifying and then Voldemort destroying all the glass in the entire ministry and Dumbledore turning it into sand like he has the counterpoint to every spell that Voldemort is actually casting and in terms of an actual wizard fight like this is a real wizard fight here and I really enjoy it I think it's actually one of my favorite wizarding battles that I can really think of from the Harry Potter universe. I don't think it comes across that he fears Dumbledore, but I think it comes across that he is a formidable opponent. I do feel like he might be afraid of Harry a little bit. I think that comes across more towards the end of that scene. So I don't think throughout the entire movie series they really stressed upon the fact that Dumbledore was like the only one he feared I think they mentioned it once or twice but not nearly with the same emphasis that they gave it in the books so I think in terms of this particular scene that's not the thought process you have going in you just think Dumbledore is a very powerful wizard and that they're evenly matched like Megan explained and I think maybe for me what came out of this as the reason why Dumbledore should be feared or maybe the reason why Voldemort feared him um, is more the power and the tools that Dumbledore and Harry and that whole maybe side of the battle have that Voldemort doesn't have is, is, is the main theme, which is love. And it's that Dumbledore is there to remind him that it's not what makes them the same, but it's what makes them different. And it's, it's about what he has that Voldemort can absolutely 100% never have at this point and never will and that that is the most powerful thing he will ever have against him and I think that's the part to be feared is the fact that even if Voldemort was the most powerful wizard on the world he'd still never have that he just can't he can't have that so I think for me that's maybe the the fear part because I think fear was a big theme in this movie in general and I think maybe this was maybe her way of turning the tables on fear a little bit and being like but way more powerful than ever being afraid is just to love and that you can overcome anything if you just surround yourself with friends and family and you remember how loved you are and how much you love them. That's, I I love, and I say that, I love that scene. And it's the scene <laughs> that makes me tear up. And what's powerful, so powerful about it is that, you know, Harry's just seen his godfather murdered. And he's still able to have pity on Voldemort. He's yeah. able to have love in some way for Voldemort. And that love coursing through his veins as he sees his friends, like it's a really powerful scene as he looks at Hermione and Ron and Ginny and the rest of them that are standing there. And even Dumbledore, like that he's not alone. And it's a really wonderful thing. And it's a, What's powerful about it is it's not just some esoteric idea of love. It's true love. It's love that's beyond yourself. 
It's love it's for another. It's unconditional. Yes, exactly. I, just, I love that idea because it's the most powerful idea on the planet. And it's the one that ends up saving everyone with Harry, you know, because he's willing to give up his life for everyone else if that's what it takes. And you understand why, right? You're you're just right there with him. It's that it's that old quote where you're sitting there and you're watching this. He's laying there with Voldemort in his head. And the only quote that runs through my mind is like, you have to do this. You have to do the work, but you don't have to do it alone. Like he has to fight Voldemort, but he absolutely does not have to do it on his own. And you can visually see that as they all stand there wondering how, what can I do to help? Like how, how, how do I, how do I do this? Like there's never whether they should, it's just, how am I going to do this today? Like we got this. And the powerful thing about that is, is it sometimes it's just being there. Yes. You know, and that's the wonderful mm-hmm. thing is like it, a lot of times we don't even know what to say. We don't even know what to do. It's just being there and letting somebody know that they aren't alone. And I, I just, I think that that's, uh, oh gosh, it's it's the the thing. It is it, you know, it's it's what matters. And it's everything. Yeah, it's you're right. giving me goosebumps right now, guys. <laughs> exactly. It's the reason that I was almost crying. I mean, there is some dust in the... <laughs> room it's sorry guys um i okay it gives you all the feels it all the feels all the feels um so i wanted to ask you because you know the end of the movie and the end of this book was such a rewarding experience well put it this way the book was such a rewarding experience because there's that wonderful chapter called the lost prophecy and everything gets explained to you finally you get <laughs> yeah. some answers and I, so I wanted to ask you guys about what you thought about that. I would say it's a minute and a half scene. <laughs> Talk about glossing over. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay. So this is a key part that every time that Matt and I have talked about something here um, in the 602 Club, we, we almost always have stark disagreements. I have no need for an expositional explanation of anything at all. I'm perfectly fine with the minute and a half explanation I got. I thought it was perfect and succinct and I was totally happy with it. Um, but every, uh, but I totally see, and I was not surprised. I would not be surprised if Matt's like, that was not enough for me. I wanted a half an hour of that. <laughs> That's just one of those things where we, we always differ. So for me, a minute and a half, I was good. I mean, maybe a teeny bit more just cause I love Dumbledore, but, um, I was, I was perfectly happy with what I got. I'm probably right in the middle of you too. I mean, on the one hand, On the one hand, I understand the film decisions that they made, right? And being so far away from the last time I read the book, I didn't feel like I was like wondering what else was there. Um, So I think from a film standpoint, the whole one, one of us has to kill the other one is fine. But in terms of being a Harry Potter fan and wanting to get as much as I can, um, yeah, I mean, that scene could have been way longer and I still would have been totally happy with it. And it was, it would have been a great opportunity to dig even deeper. I think, Matt, you were getting to this, into that Dumbledore-Harry relationship um, because he'd been pushed away for the whole film and the whole book I think it works okay in the film because it wasn't so central like we were talking about earlier. But if it had been more central, that scene certainly would have needed to be longer to to work. I think it's okay from a film standpoint, but in the extended edition, let's just dig into that a little bit deeper, I think. (laughs) I'll say this. uh, I think that because the scene resets the relationship between Dumbledore and Harry that's going to go into the next movie and that's the central thing in the next movie and the next book. Yeah. That the scene needed to be longer just because of that. Now I'm not, you know, it doesn't need to be like a 20 minute scene. Jeez. But you can give it a good four minutes, 10 minutes (laughs) because one, just think about, I'm thinking about from an actor standpoint that, that scene, Harry is angry. He finally gets to let it all out and he is literally trashing Dumbledore's office because he is pissed because of all that's happened. And he should be his he's 
he's letting out Cedric's death. It's a cathartic moment that Harry doesn't get in this movie. Mm -hmm. And they rob you as the audience, especially if you've not read the book. And we can't assume that everybody's read the book. That need you need that for the character because that's the crux of that whole scene is to let Harry finally have the cathartic release and then also the knowledge of what's coming. And it's like like we were talking about, um, Drea, like when you go to therapy, this is the scene where Harry has the breakthrough mm-hmm. and the resolution, but we never get that in the movie, and that's disappointing to me. And I feel bad for Daniel Radcliffe because he doesn't get that scene where he would just get to let loose acting, you know, to to be able to be yelling at Dumbledore and throwing things in his office. And, you know, it just it would have been a fantastic scene. And this movie is already one of the shorter Harry Potter movies anyway. I, I really think that we could have added maybe even just five minutes, but really that scene, it's like maybe a minute or so and it's just not enough um and i it does feel anticlimactic i yeah it does that's the thing there you go you hit it on the head it is anticlimactic and so if it had breathed just a little bit more it would have i think allowed you to feel like harry's emotional journey had kind of come to a nice arc and that's mm-hmm. part of the reason earlier, I, I I don't think Harry yells enough in this movie. He's not angry enough. They don't they don't play that up enough in the movie, I don't think, to to make you feel like he's truly going through something. And I just I'm disappointed in that because it isn't it kind of every actor's dream to play that kind of role and Daniel Radcliffe got shortchanged, and so did the audience. And I'm specifically thinking of an audience who may not have read the book. And that's the problem with all of the Harry Potter movies, starting with three and ending with 7.2. You make too many assumptions of your audience that they've read the books and you're not giving them enough of the story. And if there's anything that's wrong with these movies and the reason that I would be okay with them being redone in some format, like maybe a miniseries for each book, I'd be okay with because I feel like you could do it better. Well, it's such a dense world, right? Like going back to a show we talked about previously, I think that's one of the things that makes a show like Game of Thrones so successfully good is because that world is just so dense, just like this Harry Potter world. And they are going to do their storytelling in something like 73 hours. Um, And I, I totally agree with you, Matt. Like I, Matthew, I think that Harry Potter needs a good, I don't know, somewhere between 60 and 90 hours to do this story justice the way that it's laid out in the books because there's so much there. There's so much there. And it's such an immersive, fun, exciting, beautiful, emotional, heart-wrenching world um, that I think these movies just scratch, scratch the surface. For me, in terms of the emotional outburst, I feel like they'd made, in terms of the movie, I feel like I was okay with it because they'd had him do a lot more of the quiet angst and less of the outbursty sort of anger. Um, If they had had him be a little more outbursty, I feel like we would definitely want that scene at the end because it, it would feel more fluid. So that's probably how I sort of justified it to myself. Um, And I sort of felt like his outburst came when he started to chase down and hunt down Bellatrix when they were still in the ministry. Mm. If you're paying real close attention, he does use the Cruciatus curse on her, which is a huge thing for him. I mean, like, that's the thing you're not supposed to do. Um, And so for me, I feel like at that moment, he realized how far across that line he went and he didn't want to cross it again. And that's sort of how I took it. It was like he crossed the line and he now sees what anger will do for him and he wants to try a different way. And he was just sort of, for me, it was more like he was mourning and he was real sorrowful versus like angry and, and that sort of thing. So that's sort of how I felt like maybe they gave him his moment of his outburst and his, this is what anger can do for you, which is not in line with the book at all. But I sort of maybe feel like that's how that arc happened. So the the climactic emotional moment for Harry was not where it was in the book. But I feel like to an extent, he still got it a little bit. He got some of it. It's one of those things like I remember watching the extras for 
the Lord of the Rings, and you know, they would say, really, anytime we were straying too far from Tolkien, we always found that it was just best to go back to Tolkien. And I feel like, you know, Rowling knew what she was doing, and anytime you stray too much away f- from what she did, you hurt your story. And I just feel like yeah. if there's anything to I complain about, that. there's any critique, that's that's the critique I have because she's, she never does anything by accident. And I think that's one of the strengths of her books is that nothing is here by accident, whether it's, um, you know, The Mirror of Erised or uh, a mirror in one book or, I mean, just an, any number of things it's not an accident. And so I guess, you know, just talking through this one, I can't wait to kind of see where we all go with our ratings. So uh, what do you think, Drea? Oh God, I'm putting him on the spot first. I, I really like this one. I think rewatching it, I realize how much more I like it this time around than I have in the past. And honestly, realizing so many watch throughs and getting a little bit older, I'm realizing my favorite one isn't really my favorite one anymore. It's actually one of my least favorite ones. So that's really interesting. Um, I don't know. I guess I'd say it, it gets a good, a good, I'm going to give it four out of five stars, mostly because Umbridge gives me like the ultimate like heebie-jeebies and that's impressive. What do you think, Megan? <laughs> um, You know, last time we talked, I was, I had so many great things to say about the Goblet of Fire and how much I loved it. But I liked this one better <laughs> rewatching it. I was kind of shocked. You know, when I was rewatching Goblet, I was, you know, had my little notepad and was taking notes and had all these great ideas while I was watching it. And when I turned this one on, I was just trapped on my couch enthralled by the movie. So I would say I'd give this four out of five stars. It's not a perfect film, so it doesn't deserve five stars. But it's enjoyable, and I I actually liked it a little bit better than The Goblet of Fire. So I have to eat some of my words from that last podcast. (laughs) (laughs) I was surprised how much I really enjoyed this film. It's funny for me. I remember when this one came out, and uh, for a while, my my favorite was the third one. But the more I rewatched that one, the more it got frustrating to me what they leave out. Yeah, and that, that because that's my favorite book. To me. Yeah, and this one became my favorite the first time I saw it, and it's continued to be my favorite. And every time I watch it, I find more and more to love about the film and what they do for the most part. Uh, even with my quibbles, which it's still a huge quibble, I or the it's it's still a huge quibbler. Uh, <laughs> 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 but it's it's a really well made. Uh, the fact that you took the longest Harry Potter book and turned it into the shortest movie and still told the majority of the story so succinctly, which is Harry's emotional journey, I have to give them a huge amount of credit. And so for me, this is four out of five prophecies as well. Uh, it's just, it's uh, <laughs> just don't drop it. Don't drop it. Uh, it. It's a really, it's a really good Harry Potter movie. And for the most part, it's because they get most of the important things from the book right. And there's just a few things where they could have done better. And if they had, this would have been a clear five star. I mean, seriously, if that last scene had just been with the, the prophecy con- conversation had been, you know, a little longer and a little w- more well-made, a little, little more done, I wouldn't have no problems with saying, yep, uh, five star movie, even though it's got crappy CGI. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, although I, some of the CGI is great because, you know, when they... They go to Sirius's house and it Grimmauld Place and it moves over. That's wonderful. It looks so good. So mm-hmm. whatever. Yeah. Uh, anyway, I'm I love getting. I'm just, I'm just been getting a Harry Potter joy fest for the last few days. If I've been thinking about this and watching it, and I'm like, I have to go reread these books soon. I just need to reread them soon. So. Well, for this book, I am grateful that they left out a lot of the um the like love drama. You get enough of it that it's like sufficient, but you don't get like the back and as much back and forth with like Cho Chang as you do in the book where you're like, come on now. (laughs) There's a little bit too much of that in the book for me. So I was glad that they were able to still sort of give a taste of that without it being like, I'm not in junior high or high school anymore. (laughs) And I'm so glad I'm not. (laughs) Yeah. 
I yeah, I can't say I, I missed that drama either. So no. uh Man anyway, of us do. <laughs> I love talking all of the geekdoms that we do here on the 602 Club. And I'm so thankful to our associate producers through Patreon who let us do that each and every week. Davis Grayson, Ken Tripp, and of course Norm Lau. Thank you so much, guys, for being associate producers here on uh, the 602 Club and throughout the network, supporting the show on Patreon, supporting the whole network through Patreon. And and as so many of you know, and some of you might not, we are a listener-supported network. There's just no way that we can put out over 20 different shows and the special feeds that we do without the support of listeners just like you. And so go to patreon.com slash trekfm, see how you can be part of the team. We've got some great perks for you some wonderful things we'd like to give back. And also, we just like to give back and give you great content that's ad-free. You know, you just get to listen and you don't have to listen to anything else, but hopefully our scintillating conversations. So again, that's patreon.com slash trekfm. Now, Drea, uh, if anybody wants to talk to you about Harry Potter or anything like that, where else can they find you on uh, the interwebs? Um, I am at PCF Check on Twitter, and I'm at Drea Kaufman uh, on Instagram. And Megan, both you and Drea can be found on a wonderful podcast network called Educating Geeks. So tell everybody about that as well as where they can find you. Yeah. So if you want to find me personally, we'll get that out of the way. Um, you can find me. I'm at Meg Calcote. That's M E G C A L C O T E. On Twitter and Instagram. Um, but yeah, Drea and I are a part of a great podcast called Educating Geeks. You can find us at educatinggeeks.com or we're at Educating Geeks on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And we love to come and visit the 602 Club because they have a very similar mission that, that we do. Um, we don't believe in revoking your friend's geek card if they haven't participated in some aspect of geek culture that you really love. So if we found out that a friend of ours had never read the Harry Potter books and we thought that they would be the kind of person that would have read the Harry Potter books, um, we would invite them over and say, let's read the books together and talk about it after and then we'll do a podcast about it. Um, so that's what we're all about. We're, we're doing some Harry Potter on the podcast, I think, towards the end of this year. Is that right, Drea? Yeah, we'll be doing the Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. We're going to call it Philosopher's Stone because there is someone who is very particular about that. Yes. At the end of the year, that'll be our Christmas related episode. Um, and I guess there is a sort of, is it a mock of it called Wizarding People or something like that? I'm totally butchering that. So Geek Host Brie has something special in store for this podcast. So it, it'll be worth tuning into. Um, but yeah, we, we want to bring new people into our fandoms, which is why we just love coming to talk with, with Matthew. And I've been on podcasts with Norm and a couple of the other producers. It's, it's just always a good time because we all feel the same way about our favorite geek universes. So Aww, I'm getting the feels again. Oh, <laughs> very, uh, really, uh, <laughs> that's feels right. Related. <laughs> It is. It's, an it's a feels related podcast. <laughs> Potter and the Order of the Phoenix, all the feels. That's right. <laughs> Harry Potter and all the feels. Uh, <laughs> well, goodness, um, you can find me on Twitter at MattRushing02. You can also find me on Instagram at MRushing. Um, I'm going to be at DragonCon as we're recording this the next week. And so if you are there and you hear this show, come find me. So I'm going to be doing a couple of panels there. I'm really excited. Some Star Wars panels. So come check us out. We're going to have a lot of fun there at Dragon Con. Uh, I'm, you can also find me here on the network doing the Orb with Chris Jones where we're talking about Deep Space Nine. And you'll also find me on Literary Treks with Bruce, who's going to be at Dragon Con with me, and Dan as we talk about the books and the comics of Star Trek. We also sometimes get an opportunity to interview the authors about their latest work, which is a blast. And then, of course, I'm on a podcast with my good friend, John Mills, and that is Aggressive Negotiations. It is a Star Wars podcast, and we talk about a great new topic in Star Wars each and every week, and it's so much fun. So I hope that you will get an opportunity to join us there. Uh, just search Aggressive Negotiations on iTunes, or, of course, you can find us on the nerdparty.com. Well, I've got only one thing left to say. Thank you so much for joining us, and y'all come back now, you hear? Thank you.